gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about the person and the work of Christ is something that not only saves us, it continually saves us and sanctifies us and it infiltrates our life. Let's read. Let's observe the text and then we'll bring out three key points this morning. Paul is writing in verse 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. As we look at this text, Paul is making an argument. He says, even as New Testament believers, let's realize that the law, what we find in the Old Testament, is good. Even though some people may use it wrongly, it is still good. Even though some people may use God's word wrongly, it is in itself still good. But let's be careful to use it rightly. Let's make sure that we feel the weight of the law, the weight of what it communicates, but also the gospel and what the gospel brings. You see, Paul felt the weight of the goodness of the law and what it meant and what it communicated. Now, we're reading the law in the Old Testament, and many of you are reading God's word with us through the Old Testament, and right now you are reading the law, and you are just, can, you, you can't wait for the gospel of John. You can't wait to be through this. Because as you read through the law, it is at times dry, and it's, it's difficult to sometimes grasp what is going on. And as you read through the book of the law, it also seems very heavy-handed at times, and you feel like, where is the heart of God in the law? So before we talk about Paul's understanding of the law in 1 Timothy, let's take again a back step and let's look at the disposition of the heart of God. Let's be reminded of that for a moment. The kindness of God. The kindness inherent in the name of Jesus that we just sang about. That when the Bible says that Jesus, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. This is the heart of God par excellence. The heart of God to invite and to draw people in with his gentleness and kindness. From the book Gentle and Lowly, and there's several excerpts I'm going to read from this, and if you haven't read that book, I commend it to you greatly. It says, his yoke is kind and his burden is light. His yoke is actually a non-yoke. His burden is a non-burden. He has an endless gentleness and a supremely accessible lowliness. He doesn't simply meet us at our place of need. He lives in our place of need. He never tires of sweeping us into his tender embrace. This is the very heart of God. That's good news, isn't it? And it's different than the furrowed brow God staring down at you for all of your constant failures that we sometimes caricature in our mind about God. Thomas Goodwin, a Puritan, says, men are apt to have contrary conceits of Christ. But he tells them his disposition in this text in order to prevent hard thoughts of him to allure them unto him all the more. We are apt to think that he, being so holy, is therefore of a severe and sour disposition against sinners and not able to bear them. No, says he, I am meek. Gentleness is my nature and my temper. Goodwin is saying that this high and holy Christ does not cringe at reaching out and touching dirty sinners and numbed sufferers. Such embrace is precisely what he loves to do. He cannot bear to hold back. 
We naturally think of Jesus touching us the way a little boy reaches out to touch a slug for the first time with that, ew, cautiously extending an arm, giving a yelp of disgust upon contact, and then instantly withdrawing his hand. We picture the risen Christ approaching us with a severe and sour disposition, as Goodwin says. But you see, this is why we need a Bible. Our natural intuition can only give us what God is according to our own thoughts. It will, our natural intuition will only give us a God like us, not a God like him. The God revealed in the scriptures deconstructs our intuitive predilections and startles us with one whose infinitude of perfections is matched only by his infinitude of gentleness. Indeed, his perfections include his perfect gentleness toward the sinner. Now you may hear this and say, this sounds like good news that is way too good. Brother and sister, let me say to you, welcome to the gospel. This is our God. They say, what about his holiness and his justice? Yes, we'll get to those things. But the heart and the seat of God's affections, he doesn't say, I am justice. He says, I am love. He doesn't say God is anger or wrath. It says God is love. Now, as anger, wrath, and justice flow out of from his love being transgressed by sinners, and that is where God sends his son to take care of that on the cross. But let us think rightly about the disposition of God toward the world. His kindness meets us where we are at, and in kindness, God shows us himself. He shows us himself the greatest treasure and the deepest delight that can be given. And in true kindness of heart, he warns us against that which will destroy us. The law is the kindness of God. It is a kindness of God. And his disposition towards people, even in giving the law at Mount Sinai, before he gave the law, what did God say? Exodus 34, verse 6 through 7. The Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is God's heart disposition towards the sinner, and the law itself is a kindness to draw people and make a way into his presence and yet at the same time warn them against those things that will destroy them. So, number one, first observation from our text this morning. The law is good. So Paul says, we know that the law is good. Now when we're talking about the law, since Thomas Aquinas, the Christian world has largely understood and broken down the law in three helpful subcategories. You have the moral law, the ceremonial law, and civil law or societal law. Moral law, ceremonial law, and civil law or societal law. And all of these make up the treaty, the covenant that God enacted for Israel so that Israel could dwell with God and walk in harmony with him. This is a treaty that, that is supposed to, if you will, put a, a band-aid on a war raging between two parties, God and sinful man. And the treaty enacted by God is, here is the means by which there can be peace and relationship, but only in part, because it's not fully completed. Now, as we understand this and you're reading through the Old Testament, it can be helpful to think and ask the question, am I looking at the moral law, the ceremonial law, or is this the civil law that was given towards Israel and general society of that day? The moral law. The moral law is timeless for all ages. It is restated in the New Testament as being in effect and we see in the moral law things like don't commit murder, 
adultery and all the other aspects of adultery or sexual impurity that come with it. You shall have no other gods before me. These all have to do with timeless moral realities that are stated in the Old Testament and then restated in the New Testament. And we see that even in this passage today where Paul is telling 1 Timothy, we know the law is good and remember these things, these things, these issues are still issues. They're still important. They still matter. The law is good. Now when we look at the moral law, Jesus is the one who, for us, satisfies the moral law that we have broken the moral law with God, that we have sinned. If you're looking in the New Testament, as you read through the Bible, it's important to understand even just how the New Testament addresses the Old Testament. The book of Romans, almost the entire book is exclusively dealing with the fact of how Jesus Christ has satisfied the legal requirements of the moral law. You see, the moral law, we have offended God. We deserve death. We are unrighteous. We are immoral before God. But God in His grace gives us His righteousness and justifies us through Christ and His work on the cross. So the book of Romans is the satisfaction, largely, of the moral law. What about the ceremonial law? Now, the ceremonial law has passed in that it no longer remains in effect, but it still teaches us the nature of God, and it prepares us for the Messiah that is to come. It teaches us that God is holy, and that we cannot approach Him unless we have a holy mediator, that Salvation is not just, the law is not just our moral standing with God, but it's actually an access point with God. That's what the ceremonial law is. If you're reading the Old Testament, you must have this sacrifice and that sacrifice, and you must have the right clothes and make sure you not have any skin issues going in before the presence of God, that you must be totally perfect and presented perfect in order to come into the presence of God. And so, only the high priest, once a year, able to go into the Holy of Holies under very special conditions, limited access because the law constantly pointed out you are ceremonially unclean and unfit for the presence of God. Now that should prepare us. And as we look into the New Testament, man, what what book that deals with priests and access and ceremony and tabernacle and temple, what book possibly that we've spent in the last two years speaks about the ceremonial law being satisfied. See, the book of Romans talks about how Christ satisfies the moral law. The book of Hebrews talks about how we have a better priest, a better sacrifice, one who has gone all the way in and by his sacrifice gives us full access. The ceremonial law is done away with because we have a high priest who's done and taking care of it all so that Romans 5, by his merit, we can come boldly into the throne of grace. Ceremonial law foreshadows the Christ that is to come. The last one, civil law, societal law. For a particular time and place with Israel in the ancient Near East, Again, not applicable for us today in the strict statutory requirements, but it teaches us to retake and to partially resume our created role as caretaker of this earth and even society. So that the Old Testament law deals with crops and war and how to take care of the land and how to treat others and how to bring the subjugation of the land under this state of Israel and care for it in a way that brings to fruition the original commands of Genesis to go out, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth, to rule over the earth in godliness. And the civil law, societal law, in all of its aspects, both with regards to society and even how the land is to be taken care of, has to do with live out your created role. Now, the principles of that should remain in effect. We should 
act in a way that resembles our Genesis creation, caretakers of this created order. We look forward to, from the societal law, to that eternal kingdom that the book of Revelation speaks about, an eternal kingdom to be established. So as we understand the law, it is good because it is a teacher. It instructs us. And as you walk through the Old Testament in reading it, if you're reading it with us or you're doing it on your own, uh, and you're thinking through the God shots, glimpses of God, that we're going to do with the video booth or, or the, the boards out here in the International Plaza. One thing as a reminder to you is you may actually have several days in a row where your God glimpse is the same. And that's okay. Because the Old Testament is written in chunks and sections. And it might be five or six, seven, eight, nine, or ten chapters. The God glimpse is God is holy. And he's reminding us that he is holy. As we look through the Old Testament, all of it points directionally towards Christ. So that in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He doesn't say I've come to empower them or to intensify them. He says I've come to fulfill them. You know what this word has, the idea of fulfillment? It has the idea of come to complete them. I've come to bring them to their ultimate end. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, Jesus again says, for all the prophets and the law prophesied. Now this is interesting. It's actually fascinating to me. Hopefully it'll be fascinating to you. Prophets prophesied. What does that mean? Prophets taught and instructed with a forward-looking anticipation of something greater. So we think of the prophets prophesying. We sometimes read the law and think that the law is just instructional boundaries and prohibitions. But Jesus said, not only the, did the prophets speak about me, the law itself prophesied and spoke and taught and anticipated my fulfillment. So that the Old Testament law preaches Christ that is looking towards that fulfillment. Even in its repetition, could you, could you imagine being an Old Testament Israelite? Year after year, the sacrifice is being repeated and every single time the Passover came and you remembered, yep, God saved us back then, God saved us back then, God saved us back then. 100 years later, God saved us back then. 200 years later, God saved us back then. 1,000 years later, God saved us back then. Sacrifices are still in effect. Sin is still here. When is it going to be done? Even the repetition reinforced an expectation that something else needs to happen. The law is good. Galatians 3.24, the Apostle Paul says, the law was our guardian. The Greek word here is where we get the word pedagogue or pedagogy. When we, when, when we think of guardianship, schoolmaster, the law was our preparer, our schoolmaster. It says, until Christ came. So that Christ is the fulfillment of what the law prepared us for. The law is good if, second part, number two, if one uses it lawfully. So the law is good, number one. Number two, if one uses it lawfully. In other words, uses it rightly. If you're waiting for the big idea, big idea is coming in point number three, so hold on to that, please. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now, the problem is we know from last week that the law was not being used rightly. It was being misused in such a way that the result of the misuse was speculation, vain discussion, the exaltation of the messenger. Remember, some of you want to be teachers of the law. You, you want to be known as the wise academic. It bred a lack of understanding, and instead of revealing Christ, it concealed Christ. As we look at the Old Testament law, 
The law was intended, I want to give you five key things about what the law intended. Number one, the law was intended to give clarity to God's will. Not mystery, clarity. This is who God is and this is what God wants. This is God's nature and this is how to live in accordance with God's nature. So number one, it gives clarity to God's will. Number two, the law gives knowledge of the holy. Knowledge of the holy. That God is holy and we are not. That God is one whom we must approach in reverence. So the law gives clarity. It also gives knowledge of the holy. Number three, it shows God's character. It shows God's character. So that as you read the Old Testament, you see God's holiness. You also see his kindness and his patience. It shows his character. Number four, it looks for fulfillment. It looks for fulfillment. It fully realizes and recognizes in and of itself that it is incomplete. And that is why the instructions are year after year to keep doing and redoing. Because it does not accomplish salvation. Number five, the law expects and prophesies concerning Christ specifically. The law expects and looks forward to Christ specifically. So that in utilizing the law rightly, the result was understanding of God, understanding of his character, nature, and holiness. It looked to Christ and it bred a conduct of godliness under God. One of the ways you know godly teaching is because it breeds those things. If there is not a result of understanding and knowledge of God and the holy and who Christ is and the gospel that in turn breeds a godly love, that should be circumspect then at that point. What is going on? As a result of being here at Heritage, our desire and heart in our mission, we want to make followers of Jesus Christ by living the gospel life among the nations. We hope that you will know Christ better and be a closer follower as you live out the gospel in your life here in Lynchburg or wherever the Lord takes you. Be careful with those who do not use God's word carefully and be careful yourself of not using God's word carefully. Now, don't be afraid. If you're like, I don't have training. I don't have understanding. I, have, I, don't have, I don't have seminary teaching or degree. Oh, brother and sister, what seminary and degrees do, what they do is they just show you how much you don't know if you use them rightly. People who walk out and get a degree and say, well, I have a degree, so I know now. Let me be very blunt with you. It should have the opposite effect. If it didn't have the opposite effect, then the seminary or the teacher failed. Because we are given tools and understanding for how to hopefully unpack God's word, but at the same time to breed a humility of, oh my goodness, I could get all the degrees in the world and still be, I think there is so much more to God than we could possibly ever understand. So what, what for you? Just get into God's word, read it, and obey it. And the Holy Spirit will give you illumination as you understand. It will, he will illumine, give enlightenment to your understanding as you walk into God's word carefully. Now, last week, this was another slew of questions I got, is that um, there were a lot of people angry with me that I didn't give the full list of 10 last week. So here they are right quickly. Last week I said there's different ways in which we might disagree or different levels of disagreement with people. Number one, we might agree to disagree as long as we have robust agreement on the core issues. We might disagree with a Presbyterian or another member of the evangelical movement, 
but we hold fast to core doctrines, but we still agree to disagree over certain things. Number two, we disagree where I have concerns that could open the door to bigger issues. When someone says, what do you think about this individual? Okay, they're not a heretic, but I have some yellow flags, maybe some little red flags where I would say, be careful because the trajectory on which they're on, if not done with care, can lead to bigger issues. So they're concerns. Number three, strong disagreements mixed with strong agreements. Love C.S. Lewis on many points. There's some aspects of C.S. Lewis where if he wrote a commentary, we might have to condemn him as a heretic. Uh, that is how significant some of the disagreements are. But 90% of what he says, love it. Number four, an issue when there is ambiguity with Scripture when Scripture itself is not ambiguous. How many times does the Gospel of John have to say Jesus is the Son of God, divine? Well, is God really divine? You're entering a question about where Scripture itself is not ambiguous. Number five, speculations that distract from what is most important. And that's one of the things that Paul is dealing with here is that sometimes in pulpits or teaching and things like that, we, 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 we mask the gospel. We mask Christ with all other types of other issues. They're not in and of themselves bad. It might be a fun coffee conversation, but it masks Christ. Number six, of course, outright denial of core doctrines. Now, this is, of course, a big issue. Uh, and in our day and age, atonement, trinity, inerrancy, these are all big issues that are being wrangled over. But outright denial of core doctrines is, of course, something that we would disagree with. Number seven, another issue is where we have the messenger over the message. The messenger over the message. And that is where the messenger is so visible, evident, and central that the message itself is obscured. And the messenger might do that with charisma and all type of storytelling and what he had for breakfast and blah, 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 blah. All of those things are not wrong and in of themselves. But if you walk out of church with a greater knowledge or out of a spiritual time with a greater understanding of the individual than of God... That is a concern. Number eight, recategorizing of moral standards. When we recategorize moral standards and we say sexual impurity is not that big of a deal, marital breakdowns are not that big of a deal, homosexuality, things like that are not that big of a deal, that's an issue. Now, I want to give a pastoral affirmation. Some of you are fighting the battles of sexuality and sexual impurity. Praise God. Well done. Keep fighting them. Fight with your eyes and with your mind. Sometimes you're going to make mistakes. Keep fighting it. Some of you are fighting the battle over those temptations of homosexuality and lesbianism and sexual gender identities. You're wrestling with that. You acknowledge it. But you're fighting the battle. Praise God. Keep fighting the battle. And some of you are fighting for your marriages even though your marriage is not a place of peace. Keep fighting the battle. But as we fight the battle, let us not recategorize moral standards. Number nine, just being careless with holy truth, just a sloppy handling of the word, and this is seen a lot in the health, wealth, and prosperity movement, or even just greater evangelicalism where there is not a careful attention to the word. Number 10, a non-biblical agenda with the handling of the text, a non-biblical agenda with the handling of the text. And that is, I want to say something. I want to get you guys to do something. So I'm going to cherry pick a couple of verses out of context and utilize them to get my agenda done. Danger. Ten ways that we can need to be careful and to be cautious and aware Beware of charging, now here's a caution, I said this last week, but beware of charging that someone is outside the bounds of orthodoxy when in fact the only issue is that they disagree with you. So be careful about automatically going nuclear and saying you're a heretic. However, on the other side, use great care in thinking that it's just a personal opinion when in fact it's a great matter of doctrinal orthodoxy. 
The sinlessness of Christ is not just a personal opinion of disagreement. It is central to our gospel. Okay. So if the law is good, we need to use it lawfully. How should the law then be used rightly? Number three. Now all of that was just verse eight. Now we're going to go verse nine, 10, 11 in the last five minutes here. How should the law be used? The law should be used to crush us. The law should crush us. Here's the big idea. We are to be a people who feel the weight of the law. We are to be a people who feel the weight of the law. Now you say, I don't like this third point. But you see, we are called to be a people who feel the weight of the law, who feel its crushing effect and see the blessedness of being crushed by it. See the blessedness of being crushed by it. To allow the burden of the law and its total life requirement, physically, relationally, socially, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, it should bring you low and to an end of yourself. Because that's what the law is intended to do. In reading the Old Testament law, be careful about jumping so quickly to, well, Christ took care of it, so this doesn't matter to me. You should enter into it and say, how could I ever keep this? How could I ever measure up to this? Because if we go through this list, my heart is lawless. It is disobedient. It is ungodly. I am a sinner. I am unholy. And with my natural bent and personality, I profane God. I'm hostile to others, father, mother, murderer, sexual and moral, indulgent in my lust, homosexuality, perversions of the right order. My flesh wants these things. I want to bring others into a bondage and abuse. This, this is the human state. And you know what this list is? If you compare it against the Ten Commandments, it is the Ten Commandments just restated. Paul is restating the Ten Commandments here just with a little bit of different flair. As a historical note, in the past, some have said the Bible has no problem with slavery. I don't know what you do with verse 10 then. The sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality and enslavers in a culture where it was actually okay. So don't miss out on how countercultural the gospel is even in its day. And may not be slavery in our day, but sexual morality, homosexuality surely is, isn't it? These are still issues. And whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. But the law is meant to crush us. It's meant to bring us to a point and say, this is me. This is me. I am those things. And if the law is used rightly, it brings out the fact that I am a failure at these things. Now, you might say, that's a terrible thing. No, no, no. This is a blessed place to be. Because when we come to the blessedness of brokenness, then we cry out and say, it's me. God, help. So then in Matthew 5, 3, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn their sin. Psalm 51, verse 17, the Old Testament says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Some people don't like it that I say we're a church of broken people, but it is an emphasis of Psalm 51 that if we can be vulnerable and honest to say we are broken, that is the starting point of sacrifices that God wants us to bring. That says, who am I? I need a savior. I have nothing to bring but my brokenness, not my self-righteousness, not all the things that I've done. Oh, look how good I've done these things. No, I need something. I need grace. Paul says, use this Old Testament rightly, this law rightly. 
in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. Use it with. Because, you know, church number one says, I love this message. Let's grind people into the dust with the law. You're not using it in accordance with the gospel. You're only bringing one side. You're bringing the bad news, but no good news. Or some churches will focus on the second aspect of the equation, the triumphalism of Christ, but without actually bringing why we need him in the first place. The gospel is always law and grace, sin and forgiveness, bondage and freedom, weight and joy. The weight without the joy breeds despair and Pharisaism as you try and project everybody else. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. The joy without the weight breeds a shallow joy and an arrogance. Have we forgotten the weight of the law? Have we forgotten the weight of what Christ carried for us? And as you read the Old Testament law, let it be a burden. And we ask the question, how can I ever keep all of this? And then, brother and sister, we come to the New Testament. And we end with this in Romans 8. For God has done what the law could not do, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Feel the weight of the law and that I can't let it humble us, let it break us, but then let it move us to joy where we say, but I know that in Christ, everything that the law said that I break and fail at, Jesus Christ did on my behalf by dying on the cross, spilling his blood, satisfying the moral law, the ceremonial law, and setting in place a destiny that one day I'm gonna enter into a kingdom that will fulfill all his perfect plans. It's understanding it and using it rightly, beginning and end, using it according to its intended purpose. And may we never be a people who cease to feel the weight of the law. But may we also never be a people who cease to feel the weight of grace. But that's next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. Guide us, instruct us, teach us. May you be honored and glorified in us as we go about this day. Help us to feel the burden of sin. May we rejoice and expect your grace and fulfillment in Christ. May you be honored and glorified in us this week. May we take what we've learned and apply it even in our own lives. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.